We'll start out development by laying down the foundation for the game. Now this means bringing in the assets and setting up the most basic game loop. That's checking input, updating the game, and rendering output. Now before we dig into development, I want to reiterate some of the earlier points. Now since Dangerous Dave is a 1980s game, I'm restricting our tools to something that you would have found in the era. I've set up a compiler to enforce C89 as our language, but our code is so simple that it'll probably be compliant with K and RC. Now the big exception is that we'll use SDL2 so that we can compile it and run it on a modern system. But if I had a 386 with MS-DOS 5 and Turbo C, I'd probably give it a try. Now everything will be static and procedural, and I highly doubt the program will go more than 5 stack frames deep at runtime. Now I'm going to be using Notepad++ as the code editor, and I'm going to keep all the code in one large file that will probably end up around a thousand lines. I'll use a header filer for forward declaration and quick lookup of struct information. So this program isn't going to win any design awards, unless there's one for designing precisely sufficient programs. I won't be revisiting any of this code in the future, so there's no need for maintainability or scalable design. What you see will be first pass code, and if there's any refactoring masters out there, I'll leave you with a lot of things to do. Now that I've talked my way out of responsibility for everything, let's get on with it. Let's create our header file, and I'll throw in the header guards. Not sure we'll need it with a one file source program though. It's a good habit. I'll include SDL, but that's not really necessary either. We'll need to bring in the game levels that we pulled out last time, so we'll just borrow that struct that we used. Now we'll create a single main structure that represents the game of Dangerous Dave. And I'll throw in some variables that I know we'll probably need, such as a flag for quitting, that'll break the game loop. How about the current level? And we'll always need an X and Y position for the view on the screen as it relates to the game world. We may not even need Y since there's no vertical scroll. We know the game has 10 levels. I'll create a separate struct for game assets but I think we only have graphics. Normally sound assets or maybe other intermediate things would go in here. For now I'll just create 158 textures, one for each tile. Let's make Dangerous Dave. Right, fix the make file. Include all the usual suspects plus the header. So with SDL up here, we definitely don't need it in the header since it's part of the same compilation unit. Standard entry point that always returns a perfect zero. We'll define a pointer to our singleton structure and call it malloc. Now I always put free somewhere as soon as I call malloc out of habit. Let's just compile for now and make sure we're on the right track and fail. Semicolon already. I see everything here. I must have left it off one of the header structs which is messing with the C file. Sure enough. Alright, now for the game loop. We'll follow the traditional formula by checking for input, updating the game, and rendering. And I'll pass the magic game struct around everywhere. It may as well be globally declared. The renderer will need everything, plus an SDL renderer that we haven't initialized yet. I'm just sketching out these functions for now. We'll fill them in shortly. Probably need to initialize our game struct with useful data early on. Now I'll bring in SDL video with error checking. Probably the only error checking we'll ever do in the whole project. Alright, create a window with the original game resolution of 320 by 200. Declare all that. Now I'll put in a constant for scaling the screen. 320 by 200 is really small these days, but I want to keep the game on that basis and scale everything up with various sizes during rendering. With the renderer initialized, we can go back and work on the assets. We'll need to pass the renderer to the asset initializer so we can write the textures. So the first visual action we'll do is clear the screen with black. Let's move all these functions into the header file. Now 
That should be okay. Now I'll copy these out to the source and put together the definitions. So one word about organization. I tend to keep main at the top of the file as the first thing you see. Then I work down by roughly call order and stack frame order. So initializers are called first, then the function is directly plugged into the game loop. This way all of the game loop elements will always be next to each other. And the further down we scroll, the further we move away from the game loop and eventually fall into helper functions. Now there really isn't a good way to design for a single file program since it's obviously a bad choice to do that. For video demonstration it's not very practical to split things up into many files. This is the organization that makes the most sense to me. So let's compile and clear up any of the inevitable typos. All right, implicit definition must be a typo in the function. Yeah, the function is called SDL render, not SDL renderer. All right, that's it. Now there's nothing to see except a black screen, so I won't bother to run it. Now we'll initialize the game struct by setting everything to zero and bringing in the levels. Now for each of the 10 levels, we can just copy most of the code that we made during the extraction video. So we can stream the bytes from the files for each level into the data structure. That's path data, then the tile data, then the random padding. Close the file, check the build, looks okay. Now we already made the exact code for loading tiles when we built the world map last time. Let's just take that and put it under the initialize assets. Reference our data structures. Now we can't load bitmaps directly because we're storing them as SDL textures, so we have to nest the load in the convert functions. Build. Oh, error. This is called assets, not game. Copy and paste bites me again. So we're initialized, but nothing happening yet. Let's work through the game loop a function at a time. Check input works through the SDL event abstraction. We'll start with quit, which is triggered when the user cl clicks X to close the window. I'll add a frame for the key down event, but we won't use it just yet. Build check. Looks good. Let's jump down to render just to get something on the screen. We'll work through the tile information in row major sequence. Read in the byte level data. Now remember that each level is 100 by 10. Our view is anchored at zero right now. Now we'll simply copy the tile indexed by the level data to the back buffer, swap to the front with render present. Oh, I'll need to use an SDL rectangle to define the destination on the application surface. And that should define the screen. Let's build and run. And there it is, the very first room. One small step for Dave, one giant leap for yes. Now I want to control scrolling in visible chunks, so I'll set up another variable. We'll trigger that variable with left and right. Up and down, we'll change the current level. I'll add some protection on that current level code just to keep us in a defined memory space. Current level is unsigned, so a negative overflow is hex FF. Now let's move around the world. Oops, looks like a seg fault.
Yeah, we're still running pretty fast though, and this feels pretty. This feels unstable. Let's keep the view of it bounded by the screen width to prevent undefined access. Still some weird stuff going on. We're really flying because we haven't set up any delays on the game loop. It's probably blasting at a thousand frames per second. Alright, let's take control of the game loop. We'll need some timers and a delay calculation. We'll want to sample the clock before and after the game loop so we know just how much to delay. But first, let me load up Fraps so I can show you just how fast this is running. Oh yeah, 1500 frames per second. Not really playable or useful at that speed. So I'm going to go with a simple fixed time step at 30 frames per second. That's slightly better than the average performance of the original game. Let me set up the delay to a fixed 33 milliseconds and show you what happens. Now it should be 30 FPS, but it's slightly less because the game loop takes up some time. Instead, we want to count that time and subtract it from the fixed 33. But first, I notice there's something wrong with the scrolling. It won't go left. Oh, I need to make this signed or it'll never scroll left. We need a negative number for that. Now we'll subtract the game loop latency from the desired fixed rate. Cap that at zero to prevent negative overflow. There we go, exactly 30 frames per second. And here are all the levels now visible within our application. Next time we'll bring Dave to life in the first level.